Thank you very much for everyone coming uh, for such an early session. It's really, uh, it's really great to see a full room at 9.30, so I appreciate it. Um, my name is Paul Tavner. I'm the Head of Partnerships at Hindawi. Um, for those of you that don't know, Hindawi is an open access publisher, uh, publishes about 250 journals, uh, mainly in SDM fields. Um, we've been fully open access since 2007, so it's been quite a while. Um, although I am a publisher, this presentation is not going to be like a secret sales pitch. You know, you, sometimes you go to a conference and people just want to talk about their stuff. I'm going to be fairly brutal, maybe, in some ways, but I think it's probably worth it so we can all have a serious conversation about this stuff. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, talk about open access memberships a little bit. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm mainly going to be focusing on pure OA publishers, um, although I know that other types of publishers offer deposits and that kind of thing. It's, it's for the context of this presentation, it's really about pure open access publishers and how they stack up against the offering of commercial slash legacy publishers. There's a lot of variation between providers. That's something that's going to come through, hopefully, in this presentation. Um, but if we were to nail down a couple of common themes, I'm mainly talking about a system whereby APCs to get articles published are discounted in some way. That can be up to 100% if the institution is centrally funding APCs, or it could be a, a discount while the author continues to pay the APC themselves. There is almost always some kind of added value service to a membership. It's uh, whether that's an automatic deposit to the institutional repository or some uh, dashboard of metrics of usage of, of metadata associated with submissions. That's usually a component as well. And in most cases, but not all, the institution has to pay for this, right? It's a transfer of funds from the institution to the publisher in return for services uh, or discounted APCs. And the last point is a little bit more obtuse, but essentially there will be some element of talking to authors at the institution, letting them know about it, whether that's when they're already during a submission or prior to submission as an attempt to sort of drive that process. So this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are a selection of open access publishers who offer memberships. Uh, the, the number in brackets is their kind of stated membership. So you can see there's quite a lot of variation across those. Uh, and this is the name that they refer to their membership program. So again, quite a lot of uh, differences across the board. I think the main things to call out here are um, BMC, obviously, not really an open access publisher per se, considering they're part of Springer Nature, but you know they, there's a lot of legacy there. They have a huge membership scheme, 500 members. Um, I would argue that maybe there's an element of the, the, the sales representatives of the larger Springer Nature organization playing into that, that they are perhaps pitching these memberships as part of their normal conversations when they're talking about subscriptions to Springer Nature products and that kind of thing, um, but I don't have any actual evidence to back that up. MDPI is also interesting as well because they use a freemium model so that for their very uh, base level, which involves a 10% discount for APCs, they give that away for free. So any institution can get a 10% discount just by signing up to be part of the MB MDPI Institutional Open Access Program. Uh, but then MDPI will try and graduate you onto different programs and maybe you see different levels of discount and that kind of thing. But the main thing to take away here is that there's a lot of complexity in this. There isn't a lot of coalescence around particular topics and themes. There are different names for everything. And there's a sort of uneven distribution of which institutions are taking advantage of these. And I think that's an interesting question. You know, if these are good value or useful to people, you would perhaps expect those numbers to be a bit higher or maybe more consistent. And if you actually compare the member institutions, there's a lot of commonalities in some places. So a lot of institutions that are taking advantage of lots of different publisher schemes. But it's um, it's, it's not like a well-distributed thing. It tends to be certain big-name institutions in certain countries that are going out and seeking out these memberships and taking advantage of them. So what are the benefits to libraries? I mean, the librarians in the audience might uh, you know, have a different opinion on this, but as I see it, the, the kind of top benefit is the cost savings angle. Like, if you're paying for APCs anyway, why not get a discount? You know, that's a, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, it's a lot simpler for authors, particularly if there's central funding going on. They don't have to worry about paying an APC. It's, you know, it's great. They just don't even see the invoice. It just goes to the library. Um, the visibility of authors' activities to the institution, knowing what your authors are doing, where they're submitting, you know, how their submissions are progressing. 
those are all like beneficial things for libraries to be aware of. And there's a lot of features to these memberships that help people to deal with compliance issues, you know, making sure things are going into repositories, that kind of thing. The last point, it's, yeah, this is going to be a contentious thing. If I was at a different conference, maybe I wouldn't have that on there. But a lot of librarians are in favor of open access and promoting open access as a concept is a, a thing that people want to do. They want to support open access. They want to give authors more access to these options. And they want to counterbalance the offering of legacy publishers. You know, if you have a, an offsetting deal in place with maybe your Elsevier's or your Wiley's of the world, having other options or other support for different channels seems like a good thing, perhaps. You want a marketplace of options. You don't want to necessarily be streamlined into doing all your open access <coughs> Excuse me, with uh, the people that you've been doing business with for a long time. So that's the library's perspective. Publishers, again, this is going to be a bit more honest. Um, it really is a, a numbers game for publishers. I think having these memberships in place, see submissions go up. That's just a fact. Like, you know, it's easier for authors to submit. They're going to do more submissions. The publishers are doing more business as a result. Um, and we can't get away from the fact that it's a brand association concept as well, right? Everyone wants to have Cambridge, Max Planck, the big, big, big name institutions on their website and say, these people are partnered with us. We are good, legitimate publishers. You should trust us because these people do. So that's a big part of it. But I think this last point is, is a little bit more interesting because it's the concept of how the open access publishers get into the heads of, of librarians. You know, one of the talks yesterday from uh, the, Canada, uh, the California system, the emphasis there was really on how do we get the big publishers to do what we want to do. It's like librarians and legacy publishers are kind of locked together in Mortal Kombat. And open access publishers don't really have the ability to get their foot in the door a lot of the time. So it's a question of like, how do you get in their heads? How do you present your options to them? And that can often come from authors or editors, you know, making recommendations about memberships and that kind of thing. It's a more of a passive project as opposed to perhaps the, the sales force, you know, reps coming out to institutions, pitching ideas, selling things. So there's an element of, of competing with the legacy systems there. And just quickly, it's, it's not just about the institutions and the publishers. There's you know, a, a kind of benefit to the wider ecosystem. OA is uh, you know, a bubbling up force. It's, it's going on all the time. So making OA a more viable option for authors who might not be aware of it or might be concerned about price points and that kind of thing, if there is like a sensitivity there. So it's, uh, it, it's not just publishers and institutions we have to think about. So lots of benefits, lots of positives. Um, but as with everything in life, it's a bit more complicated than that. Every publisher has different workflows for these memberships. Okay, I'm sure the librarians in the room know that the, the way that a membership is activated and used can be very different from one to the other. It can be you know, a pre-submission requirement. It can be during submission. It's really difficult to know what, what, what's going on. There's a lot of complexity around pricing and the models. You know, so you, just because you get an arrangement with one OA publisher, you might not get the same thing somewhere else. And you can't really compare the two. It's hard to know where you're getting the values. It's, uh, it's a complicated thing. And that complexity is going to keep coming up, I'm afraid, because it's, you know, it's a problem that we need to solve, I think. Um, so yeah, every publisher has different workflows. And I'm going to come back to this towards the end, because there are people trying to solve this problem. <coughs> um, Every institution has different workflows and requirements. You know, it's, it's a, a matter of where you're based in the world, you know, how much support you get for OA at a funder level, a national level. Um, there isn't a one-size-fits-all that works for institutions around the world. You know, we recently found out that one of the membership options that we offer at Hindawi is just not feasible for Chinese authors because they, they can't deposit funds with a private, inst uh, private foreign body. It's just illegal. So. This is our you know, learning experience, because we're, we're new to a lot of this stuff. If we had lots of lawyers and that kind of thing, then maybe we'd be in a different boat. But you know, it's, it's complicated to work out what different institutions need and find a model that, that, that fits for as many people as possible. Um, and yeah, authors quite often get third place in this, this triumvirate of the institution, the publisher and the authors at the bottom of the pyramid. It's kind of maybe they're not getting as much communication about it. Maybe they're not being helped as much as they need to be. Um, 
maybe they just don't know about these memberships. You know, it, it, quite often it's hard to find out what memberships an, a, 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 an institution has unless you know to go to the library website, look at the list, work out, okay, I get 20% discount here, 10% here. Is that a process that authors are actually going to do? I don't know. Um, and the communication part, if, if, if a submission is progressing, normally that would be a publisher to author relationship. But now we're introducing the institutions into the mix. Do they need to be the ones to say, OK, you're part of this membership, you're getting a discount, or is that purely the purview of the, the publisher? It's a, a complicated problem. Um, and just the last point here, if something is being funded partially by a membership, i.e. it's cheaper than it would be, there's a sort of a funding process going on there, is that modifying the manuscript in some way? You know, should we be declaring that every manuscript, every article that's published that is covered by an institutional membership, that that is a factor? I don't know. I mean, it's just a, it's a question we perhaps need to think about. Um, this is something that comes up all the time for us, even though we don't have that many members at all. But like, what if you have different authors at different institutions, all of whom have memberships or some of whom have memberships? How do you start splitting the invoice? Does everyone get their discount from the different institutions? You know, there, there's so many questions about this. I mean, the consensus seems to be the corresponding author is the most important person on the list for the purposes of this, at least. So quite often, institutions only want to fund articles where the author is the corresponding author and they're affiliated to the institution. But that's not the rule. That's, you know, that's the general consensus right now. Um, and maybe that's not the right way to do it. You know, it's, uh, it's, we've been talking about credit yesterday, things like that. Maybe there should be some sort of funding author credit in, the, in that system. I don't think it's part of it at the moment, but it's, yeah, again, something to think about. This is the big one for me. Like, I, I, I care about OA, and I got into OA because I thought it was a force for good in the world, and it was a leveling force. You know, it's a, um, an equity issue. And the, the fact about institutional memberships is quite often it's the rich institutions who get the better deal because they have the staff to go out and negotiate these agreements. They also have the brands that publishers want to get. You know, if you have a choice between having a Max Planck brand on your website and maybe a, a lesser known institution, you're probably going to go for the big name and, and do more of a deal with them. So it's, um, it's a perverse influence on the system because poorer institutions in you know, developing countries are not going to get such a good deal when they go and negotiate these, um, and they just don't have the funds to spend. Like That's just a fact of the matter. You can't spend money that you don't have on memberships. So we, as publishers, need to do more to uh, make memberships that work in these systems. But it's a learning curve, and it's going to add even more complexity to an already complex arrangement. For all librarians, for all institutions, it's difficult to know where the funds should be spent. Right? You, you have However many publishers out there in the world, we talked about eight of them at the start. Um, you know, how do you know what your authors are doing? You have to go to these publishers and say, what does our APC spend? And maybe some of them are going to tell you, some of them aren't. Are you getting the whole picture? It's very difficult to know what your pattern of behavior should be based on author submissions and that kind of thing. Um, and just because authors have submitted a lot to one publisher in the past doesn't mean that's going to continue. Um, and if you're signing up for a year's membership, like maybe you're not going to be getting the great, greatest deal. So there's, there's a problem there. And just quickly, the APC gets a lot of flack. You know, it's, it's criticized a lot. It has its problems. I'm not going to pretend it's the perfect model. But in a lot of ways, it sort of re represents the people who are publishing the most research pay the money for that research to be published. And that's, yeah, OK, we can get, get into the long grass about that. But, Essentially, what the APC is supposed to be is how much it costs to publish an article. Right? We were talking yesterday in one of the main sessions about there needs to be more transparency around how these APCs are set. And that's a very good point because you know, if a publisher is suddenly just saying, oh, well, yeah, we can waive 20% off that, then you know, is, is, is that how much it actually costs? Or is it there's some, uh, there's some big margin in there? Um, there's a question of whether like, everyone should pay the same price. Should we have tiered pricing for different countries for these memberships? Um, there are mechanisms in place like country waivers to support less economically developed countries. But are they fair? Are they you know, too broad a brush? A lot of questions. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to be giving a lot of answers today. It's more of a kind of question thing. Um, 
and I, this last point happens you know, more frequently than you would think, authors come to us and say, okay, well, my co-author has a membership at their institution. Um, if I make them the corresponding author, do we get the discount? And it's like that is a, a, a perverse influence on, on the manuscripts, right? They're doing something that they wouldn't do otherwise because there's a cash incentive there, you know? And it's not their fault, it's, it's just economics, you know? If you want to save money, then you take these steps. So we don't encourage them to do that, by the way. It's, a, it's an ethical issue. So let's quickly take stock here. Sorry. Um, this is a system of asymmetry. It's, it's you know, haves and have nots. It's uh, a, a system that kind of helps people who are already doing well to continue to do well. I think that's the, the fundamental problem of memberships as I see it. Um, it's incredibly complex. Like, you know, other publishers in the room may not even understand their own systems. They definitely won't understand Hindawi's. It's, it's a system of proprietary systems, of invoicing, of systems that are built on top of legacy models of invoicing and that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's done from that mindset. It's not like a, an independent thing that's been built from the ground up. It's a complicated world with complicated systems built on top of complicated systems. And the authors are having a stranger experience as a result of these memberships. I think it's not always clear that they're going to benefit from them. They don't even know about them. And, you know, the authors are really the primary people in a lot of this stuff. You know, they're the ones that are doing the research that need to get it out there. And they tend to be a little bit of an afterthought in some of these arrangements and some of these agreements. Um, and maybe that's not the right way, way to go ahead. Is it enough that, you know, APCs and OA is, is, is going through a transition? Are we hoping that this is just going to sort itself out on, the, on its own, or that the market will take care of it? Uh, I don't know. Um, but I don't want to be too down on it. Like, I, I know this has been me moaning for quite a lot. So we always have to consider that this is a proactive step to address um, a serious problem in the industry to begin with. Like, the arrangements with legacy publishers, the, the kind of offsetting deals, that would see you continuing to do business with the people that have been picking your pocket for you know, 20 years. It, it's, it's a question of, do you want to continue to have the same relationships, or do you want to broaden the marketplace and give more options? Um, do you want publishers to compete with each other, or do you want them to collude with each other? It's a, it, it should be more about, how do we play these people off against each other to drive down APCs and see better deals and returns for institutions and, and, and authors, ultimately? Um, counterbalancing offsetting agreements is it's a real thing. You know, if, if people have to worry about this stuff, then um, it, it makes people more aware that if they're going to have the option to publish in uh, maybe Frontiers or somewhere like that versus legacy journals, that they have options to, to think about. So what's the solution? Where, where can we go from here? It's all about collective action, the way that I see it. It needs to be collective action on the part of libraries to talk to each other about how to uh, get better deals, a lot more transparency in the agreements so people understand how they can um, leverage their buying potential as an institution to say, this is a good practice, this is, what, this is the deal that we got, you guys should try and get the same deal, and making sure that like, libraries in the developing world are getting supported in the same way. Publishers, a particular way, publishers need to do more to step up and say, we're going to work together to make more of a marketplace and give people more options of where they want to publish. Um, it needs to be based on agreements on standards and workflows, and there's one more quick slide about that, um, and making sure that, like, the systems make sense, like the same deals are similar when you go to a different publisher and you know what you're going to get. It's not like you have a completely different process. Um, on the librarian side, I think there's, a, there's an onus to treat OA negotiations with the same, um, same gravity as subscription negotiations. I know it's hard because so much subscription business, so much money, but quite often it's very hard for me to even have a conversation with libraries. They just don't have the time. I know it's a time problem. I'm not, I'm not you know, pretending it's anything else. But I think if you want a marketplace where publishers are competing with each other, that's the kind of thing you have to do. It's maybe like taking a step to say, OK, I'm going to listen to what this OA publisher has to say. Maybe it's not right for you, but then you know, maybe I'm bad at doing my job. 
and support for innovative and competitive offerings, journals that are trying new things, journals that are experimenting. I think you know, we have to encourage these experiments, otherwise it's stagnation. You just continue with the status quo. So just quickly, um, I wanted to give a shout out to ESAC, uh, so Kai Gishen at the Max Planck Digital Library. Uh, ESAC is about providing recommendations for how publisher workflow should work around APCs. They're also concerned with, uh, you know, like legacy publishing and hybrid models and that kind of thing. But it's a, a real sort of call to action to standardize these things and get these systems aligned so that people are getting the same experience at different publishers. JISC has been doing a lot of really good work in this space. Uh, the Publications Router is a slightly different solution, but it's a case of if all this OA content is available, let's just aggregate it and the institutions can get it from one place. That's the kind of like practical thinking we need to uh, shift things along. JISC is also potentially interested in, in slightly bigger projects about maybe working with OA publishers to provide a kind of concerted membership um, across multiple publishers. So it's, uh, you know, there are people trying to solve this problem, but I think need, more needs to be said to, to talk about it. Okay, thanks, that's it from me. Um, I'm Paul Tavner at Ndawi or P Tavner on Twitter. I'm also on the Slack. So if anyone wants to talk, I know at this conference we kind of rush straight onto the next thing. So if anyone wants to talk to me afterwards or just find me for the rest of the day. So it's really great to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Thanks very much. Yes, go ahead. Can we bring the mic to the to the front? Is that okay? Sorry, this this gentleman was just first, and then we'll uh, we'll come to you, Bob. Yeah, Gunter Eisenbach from Jamia Publications. I agree with all your concerns you have raised uh, about the, the the institutional membership model. Just want to add one more concern which you may not see being from a large publishing organization. But there's a long tail of open access journals and smaller open access publishers, right? Yeah. And the concern I have with the model is that once an organization has signed up these five large OA um, publishers, yeah. it is very hard for a smaller OA publisher with only like 30 journals, which publish only in a niche uh, uh, area to compete with these offerings, right? Because the institution will say, oh, what's the problem? We already have like 500 journals signed up by these five different publishers, 500 journals each. So we publish there, right? Yeah. So that's kind of, and uh, it's my personal experience that librarians won't buy institutional memberships from smaller publishers who have yeah. only like 30 journals, they yeah. just won't. So that is just a concern which I want to add to this model. And I don't know what the solution is here. Yeah. Uh, I just want to raise this as an additional slide, which is the rich gets richer. It's not only like on an institutional level yeah. a problem, but it's also like on the publisher side of a problem. Yeah, that's a very good point, And I don't have a, a, a proper response to it. It's more um, some sort of coalition of smaller publishers could be an option, like a, a concerted <laughs> effort to, to provide these things for smaller publishers, but it's a complicated problem. And then, yeah, thank you for making your point. Hey. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm Bob. I work at the Open Research Group within Springer Nature and was hired nine years ago to sell memberships for Biomed Central. So um, uh, the normal sales, the licensing sales team don't want to have anything to do with this conversation. So they got very adept at saying, oh, I'll, let me put you in touch with Bob. So just wanted to clear that up. That's not yeah. part of their mission. Um, for us anyway, we um, don't insist that the corresponding author be the primary author. Mm -hmm. So we know, we, and we, we're not bothered by the fact that the fifth author on the paper whose institution has a membership is the corresponding author. And we'd say, yeah, that's fine. Um, we're pretty convinced, and I think others have validated this too, that the, the um, reputation of the journal far outweighs in the decision of where to submit an article, whether or not it's OA, and whether or not there's an OA membership. Mm -hmm. And in fact, while we're not um, walking away from memberships that exist in our organization, our, we've de-emphasized trying to sell more memberships a great deal because we've seen the evidence that 
is not as important as it once was to get the concept of OA out there. When Biomed Central started, it was a whole different environment. Yeah. Um, and that we're not entirely convinced that if a membership is in place, that it really does affect the amount of submissions, mm -hmm. good publishable submissions yeah. that come to you. And so it may, over time, yeah. drop off. Yeah, I realize I didn't answer the question in the, in, the, in the slide, but there's that rule of headlines, which is if there's a question in the heading, it probably means the answer is no. So do open access, inst uh, open access memberships have a future? Probably no. In their current form, I think there's there's room to uh, improve and change the system, uh, but maybe it's a, a, a it's going to be a very different system at the end of it. So yeah, thank you for your point as well. Hi. Hi. Oh, okay. okay. I have more of a comment than a question. Um, I'm a librarian who's responsible for trying to track or collate all of discounts at our institution, and I think. One of the premises of your talk assumes that the collections people, because I work at a large institution, understand the value of an APC discount, mm -hmm. and that we have workflows and structures within our institution to take that information within the license and extract it out and present it within a catalog system or some other system that is easily trackable or can you can collate in some easy, you know, yeah. automated way. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. And this is a big problem. And for every single time we have a researcher come to us and ask us if we have a discount, we have to spend at least four or five hours trying to figure out, for every single request, yeah. if this particular journal has a discount, yeah. or if this journal is an exception for the publisher for a discount or not. Mm -hmm. So. These are big issues that are demanding a lot of librarians' time. We have our own internal issues in terms of organization that we definitely need to work out. But I think it is incumbent on publishers to make this easier mm -hmm. for libraries yeah. to make that value apparent to our researchers so we can all benefit from OA. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's a very good point. And I think there should be uh, an effort by publishers to produce a way to make it easier to check that don't involve people going into the submissions channel before they work out that they might get a discount or not. I think that's a, an excellent point and I fully agree with you. Yeah, thank you. We have time for one more very quick question. Oh, it, it just, runs. yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, it just about um, uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Dast was talking about a countrywide yep. um, uh, service where readers in the country can read the, 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 the paper. And, you know, a flip side to this is that I, I teach and, and publish in the global health area. Mm -hmm. And it would be wonderful if I could deposit a paper in India yeah. with the help of a publisher uh, that could even be translated or have a, a translated abstract. And, and, you know, that could be another model to add values as publishing as a service rather than just selling a product. Yeah, more sophisticated methods of distribution. Uh, abstracting and indexing isn't just enough on its own, although publishers do a good, good enough job of that. I think it could be a lot better as well. So thank you for your point. And thank you very much, everyone. I'm sorry to keep you here. Cheers.